And I'm really happy today to have Marcella, one of our ambassadors, and she'll explain everything who she is um, and to talk about what she does. And I have to say, I've had a quick look at this already, a sneaky <laughs> peek, and like it's fascinating and I didn't realise how much work there was involved. Um, just a quick note, we are recording the session because we're hoping for it to be available to the whole of our primary care team um, for those that couldn't attend. Um, if that is an issue that you don't want to be seen or your comments said, just make sure you put your camera off. But ideally, we like to see faces because um, it's much easier speaking to someone there. Um, brilliant. I'm going to hand over to Marcella. That's perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, has the recorded um, recording started or? Denise, can you confirm? Yes, recording started. Perfect. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much. OK, so let's move on. OK, so first of all, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm going to present this Meet the Role Social Prescribing Link Worker session as part of the Nottinghamshire Alliance Training Hub Educational Session. And um, yeah, as Sarah mentioned, my name is Marcella. And, you know, for those of you that don't know me, um, I'm a social prescribing ambassador for the Nottinghamshire Alliance Training Hub. So I just want to uh, briefly um, mention the agenda for today. So I'm going to give you a brief overview of my background. Uh, an overview of what social prescribing is, and then I'm going to talk through some of the challenges that we're facing in the healthcare setting, and then I'm going to talk through the role and the responsibilities of social prescribing uh, link workers, and oh, sorry, <laughs> and um, how a day has a social prescribing link worker and how we do support patients. Um, I also look into um, you know how to measure outcomes of the social prescribing interventions. I will present uh, two case studies and the benefits of social prescribing and how people can access and patient can be referred to us. And then there's going to be a conclusive slide where um, I'm just going to share with you some useful uh, links that you can access if you want to know more about the service. And then there's going to be time for Q&A. Okay, so in terms of my background, so um, I have completed a bachelor um, degree in psychology and a master degree in neuroscience when I was in Italy before moving to the UK uh, a little bit longer than five years ago. And then since I moved, I also completed a master in health psychology while I was working as a support worker, supporting people with learning disabilities. And then I find out about the social prescribing service and I really wanted to know more about so I applied for this job in um, December, I think it was 2020. And um, I've been doing yeah. this from January 2021. I've been working for the Nottingham City General Practice Alliance, um, again, in Nottingham City as a social prescribing ambassador, sorry, as a social prescribing link worker. And then in uh, September 2023, um, I had the opportunity to become one of the um, ambassador for the Nottinghamshire um, Alliance training up. And uh, as you can see on the left side of the screen, I am part of uh, a team of other ambassador. Ideally, we wanted to cover the 16 additional roles within the primary care. But so far, um, I'm working with, uh, you know, a nursing association ambassador, a physician associate, um, pharmacy team, um, two first um, contact uh, practitioners, the advanced uh, practitioner, care coordinators, uh, the project team managers, and also we're working in partnership with uh, the lead uh, senior pharmacy uh, technician and the digital business and um, transformation manager. But so what do I do as a social prescribing ambassador? So as a social prescribing ambassador, I cover not only Nottingham City, but also uh, Nottinghamshire. And uh, for those of you uh, that um, haven't had the chance to talk to me just yet, um, my role has been uh, focusing on promote the social prescribing service across the area, trying to understand uh, the training needs um, and also running educational sessions like this one. That is my first uh, session um, and I'm planning to run more probably in the future. Um, I'm also focusing on on, uh, you know, improving the relationship with the stakeholders and looking into how we can improve retention, looking into career progression and uh, apprenticeship opportunities, and also promoting community practices, uh, sessions and peer support network with a focus on the primary care um, network. Okay. 
So what is social prescribing service? So the social prescribing uh, seeks to address people's needs in a holistic way uh, in order to support individuals with a, a wide range of social, emotional and practical issues. And as a social prescriber link worker, we can support individuals to find information on their situation. We can connect them with services and or activities that can help them feel better. And we can also help them to improve their well-being in a way that suits them. And um, according to the NHS social prescribing framework, we can support people for an average of six and 12 contacts over a three months period. And also we have a typical annual caseload of up to a maximum of 200 or 250 um, patients for a full time contract. But um, I want to mention that, of course, this number can be lower or higher and that it depends on the complexity of the individual needs, um, the maturity of the social prescribing scheme uh, and any additional responsibility such as you know community development activities or outreach project but also the PCN uh, needs as well. But what are the challenges that we're facing in the healthcare setting right now? So just to name some, uh, of course, there's an increased demand and that is because of the aging population is leading to more chronic disease and, you know, there's a higher demand for healthcare services. There's a staffing shortages and that means that, you know, there's a significant lack of healthcare professionals. There's some funding constraint. So there are budget limitation uh, that are um, having a negative impact on the service delivery. There's also a mental health crisis because there's a rising of mental issues but uh, there are not adequate services that can support to tackle this and also there are some health inequalities so disparity that exists uh, in the health outcomes of our patients and then some public health issues that are um, about you know problems like obesity smoking they're still quite relevant and prevalent in our setting so in order to address these challenges um i had a look at the nottingham and nottingham uh, nottinghamshire nhs joint forward plan and they last sorry the most update version that uh, has been reviewed in june 2024 and it's going to run until 2028 and they have implemented a plan on based on four strategies so the first strategy is to uh, improve our outcomes in population health and um, healthcare. Uh, and the idea, again, is to uh, announce the quality of care, um, you know, for the population. The second is to tackle inequalities uh, in the outcomes, in the experiences and in the access. And again, this is to ensure equitable access to the healthcare services. And then the third strategy is to announce the productivity and the value for money which means that we need to make sure that the existing services are effectively uh, supporting the goals of improving health uh, outcomes and tackling um, inequalities. And then the fourth uh, strategy is to support broader social and economic development, which again means that we need to recognise the role of health in economic and social well-being as well. So what is the social prescribing? Uh, what is the role of social prescribing in all of this? So we play a crucial role because we can address the population health management through data-driven planning and practical care delivery. And what is exactly the um, what is exactly the uh, the approach that the NHS uh, is adopting to uh, you know face these challenges and also to reduce this inequality? So uh, their approach is the core twenty plus five. So we call twenty. We are focusing on the most deprived twenty percent of the national population, as identified through the index of multiple deprivation. Plus means that we are targeting local population that could be, I don't know, ethnic minority communities, people with disability, people with long term health conditions or any other group that are experiencing social exclusion. And then five means that we are focusing on five key clinical areas that really needs improvement. And these areas are maternity. So we need to ensure that um, there's a continuity of care for women from black, 
Asian and minority ethnic communities and the most deprived groups. And then we need to look into severe mental illness. So again, we need to ensure that there are annual physical health check for people experiencing mental issues um, to meet the national targets. And then the chronic respiratory disease um, in order to improve diagnosis and management, the early cancer diagnosis in order to announce the early detection and the treatment, and then the hypertension case finding in order to identify and managing eye blood pressure in an effective way. And again, according to, and again, um, the role of social prescribing is really important in all of this because we know the community needs and the issue. We can connect, we can connect people to the help they need in order to address the wider determinants of health. We can prevent health issues from recurring or deteriorating because we can support people to live healthy lives based on what matters to them in also raising awareness of the health prevention of, um, offers. And I also like to um, mention some really good, um, you know, a project that we run in, in my PCN um, as an example of how the uh, the social prescribing service can co contribute to this approach. So um, as a social prescribing link worker in Nottingham City, um, I uh, cover Basswood and Sherwood. I work for PCN5. And in our area, we've been working on proactive care, personalized care project, and we run on a regular basis community apps. And the idea is that we've been focusing on identify and overcoming barriers to health and well-being to our local patients and we made the services uh, more accessible to those in need um, and this is for example for the you know high blood pressure case funding where it's been the results of um, a really good um, collaborative teamwork. But exactly what is the role of social prescribing link worker and what are our responsibility? So first of all, I want to mention that we are part of the personalized care team. So we work really closely with health and wellbeing coach and care coordinators, and we adopt this personalized care approach, which means that we give people choice and control over the way the care is planned and delivered. We focus on what matters to them. We take into account their strengths and needs. We enable them to be heard. We involved uh, the individual in uh, decision-making processes. We undertake personalized care and support planning. And we also promote support behavior change. And we do that through coaching and motivational interviewing techniques. We also demonstrate cultural competence and understanding of equality, diversity and inclusion. We understand the social wider determinants of health, health inequalities and population health, as I mentioned before. We understand obligation to safeguard individuals from harm. We support accessibility to community groups and all services. We identify and maps uh, community assets. Um, and we share essential information with our local uh, population. We clarify and summarize information that are, you know, has appropriate, and we also demystify the information and check their understanding when we share them with our patients. We utilize available evidence base for social prescribing intervention and activities, and we contribute to asset-based community development and community resilience. So our role is often mistaken for that of a social worker and support worker. So I just thought that it would be uh, useful for us to kind of make a distinction of the different roles. So um, a social worker is a professional that provides comprehensive social services, address a deeper and often more complex social, emotional and economic issues through direct intervention and ongoing support. But um, mostly, like uh, most importantly, they need to be registered with the Social Work England in order to be, um, you know, to work as social workers. And a support worker is a professional that assists individuals with um, daily living activities, sometimes even personal care needs, can provide practical support, they can offer companionship, they can assist with mobility and transportation and so on. And there are no set entry requirements, requirements in order to become a support worker. And then what is the, what, what do we do then? What a social prescribing link worker does. So what we do, we primarily bridge a gap between the healthcare and the community resources in order to address the non-medical determinants of health and to support our patient. And we work collaboratively with additional staffs and the GP staff, um, GP practice staff.
And according to the new uh, network contract, uh, now it is essential uh, for, you know, when you apply to become a social prescribing link worker, um, you know, to have uh, NVQ level three or advanced level or equivalent qualification or working towards. And also um, you, we need to have like a demonstrable commitment to professional and personal development. What it is still desiderable is the training in motivational coaching and interviewing or um, equivalent experience. And I just would like to really touch briefly on what are the training requirements once, you know, we become a social prescribing link workers. So again, according to the network contract desk, uh, 2024, 2025, uh, social prescribers that are employed in or by the primary care networks must complete the uh, mandatory e-learning program um, that you can find online on the e-learning for healthcare. Uh, they need to enroll in or undertake or qualify from appropriate training as defined by the Personalized Care Institute. And they need to attend peer support networks that are delivered um, at the place or system by the uh, ICS and or NHS England in the region. But so how does a day as a social prescribing look like? So first of all, um, I want to mention that our job role um, involves various activities that are mainly centered around supporting patients. So it starts with a referral that we receive from the GP staff, or it could be the voluntary uh, community sectors or even local agencies. Um, and what we do, we can utilize a range of consultation methods to make contact with uh, our patients. So we can meet them face to face and that could be in a clinic room, if there are rooms available at the GP practice, we can meet them in community venues, we can meet them in their homes, or when not possible, you know, we conduct this consultation over the phones. And what we do, we actively listening to what matters to them and what really motivates them towards the change. We try to gather information and adapt questioning styles according to their preferences and their needs. We'll be trusting this relationship with the individual. We adopt an holistic and person-centered approach. We connect, once we identify the barriers, we connect them to community and voluntary groups locally so that they can receive the support they need. And to do this, sometimes we can work in partnership with other agencies. We can also support individual with referrals when needed, or we can support them accessing session in the community if that's what, you know, um, is their way to overcome the barrier. But mostly we empower them to take control over their health and well-being. And there are, you know, different reasons why a patient could be referred to us. And I like to talk about this, you know, thinking the wider determinants of health. So we look into, you know, uh, patients that might have uh, issue with economic stability or education access or, you know, social support network or physical environment that, for example, could be like the housing condition or employment and working condition. Make sure that, you know, if they are if they want to get back into employment or if they have if they have any issue with their current working hours and so on. We also consider their culture and what that could, uh, you know, how that can impact on their health. We can look into health behaviors and coping skills in terms of the lifestyle habits and if you know they want to um, make any change around that and then you know even uh, we look into the relationship with the health services and we can as I mentioned before promote any kind of prevention and support them to access services when needed. But I also want to mention that our role not only is focused on person uh, on the on the patient support but it also involves maintaining uh, accurate records of our intervention with the patient that usually we record on the medical system. Um, asset mapping, we uh, make referrals on patients' behalf and we also manage our caseload. We write up case studies, we can work on newsletters to promote what we do. We uh, attend on a regular basis MDT meetings, that stands for multidisciplinary teams meetings. We attend community practices, peer support networks. We can also attend neighborhood partnership meetings. We attend supervision groups and case review on a regular basis. We can take part in project works and we also undertake um, continuous professional development that has a, that it is a key aspect of our role because it ensures that we remain effective in our support effort. But how do we measure then the outcome of a social prescribing intervention? So according to the NHS uh, social prescribing framework, again, we should all be using the ONS4. So ONS4 stands for Office for National Statistics and for 
uh, means that we are um, capturing four um, dimensions. Sorry, four dimensions about the patient well-being, and these dimensions are. Um, the, the patient life uh, satisfaction, their sense of whether the life is worthwhile or not, their level of anxiety and happiness. And the patient, and what we do, we ask a patient a question and then we ask them to score the answer on a scale from zero to 10. And this score provides a really good insight into their overall well being and also um, a good insight about their personal perspective. And sometimes it could serve as a really good starting point to delve deeper into the needs and barriers um, of the individual so that we can support them to just to address them. And also, it's quite a good tool because um, it uh, gathers information directly from the individual uh, about their own well-being. And in this way, it kind of allows them to prioritise what matters to them um, uh, in their response. And um, it's important to notice that we need to uh, complete this personal personal well-being tool at the beginning and at the end of the intervention uh, so that we can compare and see and notice if there's been like a change in the way they feel about the personal well-being. And uh, later on in a few slides, I will present a case study with a good example of um, this personal well-being tool at the beginning and at the end of my intervention with one of my patients. Another tool that we could be using uh, in order to assess and monitor the health-related quality of life of the patient is the EQ5D. And the idea is that, um, you know, we um, this tool uh, measures five dimensions. There are the mobility, the self-care, usual activities, pain and discomfort that the patient might be experiencing, anxiety and depression. And um, the patient has to give an answer on three levels. So they might identify, you know, that there are no problems problems with the dimension just mentioned or some problems or extreme problems and the idea is that depending on the answer then we can again tailor um, our intervention to the individual needs and we can also make sure that they achieve uh, the desired outcomes uh, you know in order to improve their well-being um, and again uh, it, it could be like a really good starting point to delve into deeper concerns or support that the patients might need. And uh, at the end of these um, questions, uh, we also tend to ask the patients, uh, you know, how they would define their health today. And they have to give an answer from a scale from zero to 100, where zero is the worst um, uh, health they can imagine for themselves. And 100 is the best health they can imagine for themselves. And again, this is, could be useful as a starting point um, to tailor the, the support that we can offer them. So now I just would like to present some case studies. So it's just two case studies. The first one is um, about a patient that I've supported not long ago. Uh, so when I supported her, she was over 65 and um, she attended one of our community app uh, where she got connected with a service that supports um, people with a physical health condition to move into um, suitable accommodation in order to prevent hospitalization. And uh, attending this community app, the patient also express interest in the social prescribing service so when I firstly uh, made contact with her she mentioned that she was struggling with grief loneliness and mobility issues um, so she was still grieving the loss of her husband and the son she was living with a daughter um, but because of uh, ongoing really bad back pain uh, she was basically stuck in the house and she couldn't go anywhere and she was really she was feeling really really lonely um, so what I did, I initially liaised with uh, Housing to Health, that is the service in Nottingham City that support people to live in, sorry, to move into more suitable accommodation. Um, and what I did, I explored what was the plan with them. And um, they told me that they were looking into supporting the patient to move into a complex building where they also had the opportunity to engage in activities in a communal area. And once I liaised with the housing coordinator, I make sure that they arrange a visit to this complex so that the patient could kind of access this community uh, activities so that she could familiarize with the environment and also meet some of the residents. Um, and also I address the patient mobility issues. So I refer her to the community rehab and force team and then they refer her to the pain clinic to address the pain as well. And I also tried to explore, you know, what kind of support she needed around a grief, but she was a little bit reluctant to receive any further emotional support. So I just signposted her to a few services for her to access when she was ready. 
And, oh, sorry, and uh, I forgot to mention that what she agreed for was a referral to the NHS responders. So she started to receive uh, weekly calls from volunteers for 18 weeks, which she found really helpful. But uh, the outcome was that she felt so encouraged to move into the new complex after, you know, experiencing how um, the place looked like and she met new people and she was really pleased about that. Um, and mobility improved because of the intervention of the community force and rehab team. And also, again, she started to attend social activities, which had a really positive impact on a um, social isolation. And as you can see on the right side of the screen, there's a really good comparison of uh, the ONS4 at the beginning and at the end of the intervention. So at the beginning, patient told me that, you know, she wasn't feeling really satisfied about her life. And also she felt that the things she was doing were not um, worthwhile. And at the end of intervention, the score changed completely and, you know, she felt more satisfied. She, she thought that, you know, the things she was doing were more uh, wor like more worthwhile. She felt like slightly happier. And the only thing that didn't change was the anxiety level. But that is because at the beginning of the intervention, she didn't know what to expect. And at the end of the intervention, she was in the middle of moving to the new complex. So that was quite stressful for her. But uh, as you can read at the bottom of the screen, uh, she was really thankful about my intervention. And she said that thanks to the social prescribing intervention, she could see the light at the end of the tunnel. And another case study that I'd like to present um, is just to, again, uh, demonstrate <laughs> the impact of our work. Uh, and this is because this patient journey really underscored the critical role of social prescribing in navigating complex challenges and supporting individual during vulnerable, vulnerable life transition. So in this case, I supported this patient that um, was 31 years old, um, pregnant. Uh, initially, she was referred because she needed support with finances, but by the time I made contact with her, uh, she um, got admitted to the hospital because she had to deliver a baby. Uh, so when I spoke with her, um, she uh, her situation completely changed. So uh, immigration status changed. Uh, she had no social network whatsoever. Uh, there were some language barriers, and she really needed to. Um, she did really needed help to move into a more suitable accommodation with the baby because initially she was living in a share accommodation, but she could not return that. Sorry, she could not return there with a baby, so she had to find another place. And what I did um, with that consent, I liaised with the home office, I liaised with housing aid framework, and we look into more suitable accommodation. And also in order to facilitate their discharge from the hospital, she needed like a, a baby seat and she had no uh, baby essentials or food for herself whatsoever because she was still waiting for the first payment of universal credit. So I made sure that, you know, I connected to the right place, the right charity. And once I collected all the items that she needed um, and I delivered them to them, she was able to be discharged. Um, and then um, housing aid support her. But um, unfortunately, uh, she was only available to move uh, from auto to auto. Um, in order, you know, to have like a, a kind of a safe environment where to live with the baby. Um, and uh, during Christmas time, um, my colleague, my manager and I supported this patient to, to move out from auto to auto. Um, and again, I also liaise with the midwife to support her with um, Nottingham City Care due to positive complications. Because again, due to the language barrier, she really needed help to navigate the system and she was new to Nottingham as well. Um, and again, once she kind of stabilised, I supported her and I signposted her to community um, groups in order to kind of build the social network. And this patient uh, was really grateful for my support and she spent 16 weeks uh, moving from auto to auto and at a certain point she just decided to move back to London. She was... Um, where she received a support from a close friend and also um, she asked help, um, you know, to the council and they were able to find her a temporary accommodation, which she was really happy about. So what are the benefits of social prescribing? Uh, so there are some research studies that demonstrate that social prescribing can have a positive impact on mental health because it can reduce symptoms of anxiety, depression, loneliness. It can improve physical health because it can encourage people to adapt healthier lifestyle habits. It can reduce demands on healthcare services. It can improve community engagement and in general can improve the overall well-being, the sense of ownership and the activation and we activation what 
what we mean is the level of motivations that the patient has towards and confidence towards their own health. Um, but I have to say that uh, even though there are some studies that demonstrate the benefits, um, there are still some challenges because, um, and these challenges um, include the variability in the implementation of this research study, the lack of standardized metrics, and the link for the need for long term research metho methodologies to assess the outcomes comprehensively. Because this study has been run uh, during the intervention and just after the intervention, but we don't know exactly what happens, you know, in like six months. Uh, you know, post uh, social prescribing intervention, um, and also uh, measuring uh, measuring the social outcomes is quite complex uh, because um, you know of the diverse participants' background, the different sectors, and as we all know, um, even though we all like the social prescribing. Um, you know, it's quite common, like it can be run differently according to the population needs and uh, the, the needs of, you know, the, the network as well. So that's why it might differ, the, the outcomes might differ. So how people can access um, and refer patients to the service. So ideally anyone over 18 years old can request the GP reception staff for a referral. I have to mention that in, I think it's Nottingham uh, North and East, there's also base 51 that support people um, sorry, uh, young people, so 11 to 25 years old, um, and the GP can refer um, into base 51 to receive social prescribing support. Uh, but anyway, the referral is uh, accessible through F12 on the medical system. Um, the referrals for my refer across the area, so across Nottingham City and Nottinghamshire, but what it is really important is to uh, define why the patient has been referred to the service and um, most importantly, it's really uh, essential that the patient consent to be referred to the service. Um, and our role is to kind of educate the practice staff in order to, you know, uh, let them know how to process referral, how to refer to us um, and make sure that they feel comfortable with the process, you know, overall uh, process. Um, and I want to mention that everyone in the PCN, so all staff, in the PCNs can make a referral to the social prescribing service and then some PCNs might also accept self-referrals. On the right side of the screen I just mentioned I just want to uh, briefly uh, touch on the different kind of um, services that are available across Nottingham City and Nottinghamshire. So there's a social prescribing service as I described it today that is available in primary care but then there's the Queen's social prescribing there's, new, there's more community based there's the hospital and um, A&E social prescribing that I think is running in um, Bassett Law and then there's a children and young people social prescribing, counselling social prescribing, mental health social prescribing, active travel um, and community sector uh, some uh, social prescribing. So just to conclude, um, you can find at the top of the um, of the screen my email address so please feel free to get in contact with me if you require any uh, further information or if there's anything that you want to discuss with me and I also want to take advantage of this to um, promote the personalized care community practice that is run by Maria Willis that um, is the head of social prescribing she runs these sessions every eight weeks and I believe the next one is Monday the 22nd of July and is an opportunity for social prescribers care coordinators and health and well-being coach to get together to share good best practice and I also want to mention that I'm planning to you know create this uh, peer support network through MS team chat um, and the idea is that you know um, is a platform that could uh, allow us to share information successful stories promote events provide mutual support um, and making communication easier foster connection and also re reducing feelings of isolations within our network and also, I'm encouraging people to, if they want, to book one-to-one -one with me to discuss anything that could be related to your role or anything that, you know, social prescribing um, that you want to discuss with me. Um, and then there's a list of useful links that you could access um, if you want to know more about social prescribing. So the first one is the uh, e-learning for healthcare. So the mandatory training that we all need to complete in order to, you know, when we start this uh, job role. And then if, if you want to know more about social prescribing, um, you know, you can 
can explore and navigate the Personalized Care Institute, the National Academy for Social Prescribing, the National Association for Link Worker. If you want to know what the other social prescribers are doing in England, so not only Nottingham City, Nottingham Shire, you can also sign up for the future NHS platform. Um, and if you want to know more about what we do locally, then you can have a look at the social prescribing and community-based support um, for the NHS Nottingham and Nottingham Shire ICB. Uh, I believe we're going to distribute these slides at the end of the session, so you will be able to access the link, these links anyway. And then I, before going to the Q&A, um, I just want to promote the Grow Notes primary care app. So um, you can easily download on your phone. So you have the QR code at the bottom um, and it is just an app that uh, you can have, you know, in your pocket. It's quite easy to access and it gives you the opportunity to explore any CPD across Nottinghamshire. You can also turn on notification and any filters related to your job role or interest. And it gives you like the opportunity to be up to date with any information and events that are relevant to you um, about the Nottinghamshire Primary Care Network. And then these are uh, our Nottingham, um, Nottinghamshire Alliance Training Hub communication channel. If you're not signed up to our newsletters, this, you know you can always do that uh, in order to receive the latest information on events, training and funding opportunities. And then you can follow on all the other platforms um, if you want to. And that it's all for me and yeah so happy to answer to any of your questions if you have any thank you so much for that marcella um that was really really informative and i probably haven't appreciated how much you do um and how much information that you need and things like that whilst people think of a question please do write in chat or put your hand up um, so if I'm working with a patient as a pharmacist and put my pharmacist hat on, yeah. um, how is it best to explain what a social prescriber does? Because I don't think the title is particularly help no. helpful. So what I usually tend to mention to my patient is that uh, we support people with non-clinical issues that might have a negative impact on their well-being. And what we try to do, we try to connect them to services that can help. Is it like is easy enough? <laughs> Brilliant. My own, my only comment about would be what's non-clinical. Well, I feel like medication is clinical, so you know, and it's true that we work in a clinical environment, but uh, we are not clinicians, um, so we always have to refer back, you know, if there are some clinical um, inquiries, uh, that you know, um, so yeah, non-clinical, non-medical issues. Cool. Thank you. Has anyone else got any questions or anything? Anyone want to share anything that they do that works really well in their practice? I can I can find another question whilst we <laughs> wait. So what what do you think is the biggest success that you've had in your PCN as a social prescriber? Um, this is an odd one. I feel like just be there for our patients. So we have um, taken part to different kind of uh, project. And what we realize is that um, even like for proactive project, just making contact with the patient and offer support uh, for for many of them made the difference. So just to let them know that, you know, the support it is available for whenever they want to. Um, and I think it, it's really good. And like the majority of them are not aware of that. So the fact that we can offer that support is really valuable. Brilliant. Any other questions for anyone? Avril, thank you. You saved me. <laughs> <laughs> Marcia, do, can I ask, do you get many inappropriate referrals? And if um, so, what, what are your sort of inappropriate referrals? that you that you get in through yeah so i didn't kind of cover that for a specific reason and that is just because we all kind of work differently so talking to the different uh, team across the area i realized that there are some teams that have uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria um and are other teams that basically help with you know help any any patients with any issues and then if you know one is 
too much or beyond our competences, we refer back. So it's quite difficult to have like a proper answer to this. Um, because, uh, I mean, especially now in, in my PCN, we always try to help. Um, and only when, you know, it's not possible. So I don't know, I will say probably if there are uh, people in mental health crisis, we try to refer back to the GP. So again, where there might be like a medical intervention rather than um, our intervention. I hope I've answered to your question. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Joanne, go for it. Um, I'd just be quite interested to know whether there's anyone on the meeting that um, that didn't know what social prescribing was or it's something different to what they thought it was. I think sometimes, it, you know, until it's sort of wrote down and you're looking at actually how much we do yes you know we just you just do it don't you you know and that was a bit like wow yeah. we do a lot don't we <laughs> yeah yeah it's really incredible <laughs> it's really really incredible I've, i haven't got a question um it's more of a thank you to marcella to making for making people aware of like you say, the things that we do that, like you say, we do automatically without thinking of it. And I don't think she's even put the rest of it, like the admin and all the other stuff, <laughs> ringing back services that don't get back to you, doing referral forms that take time, that bouncing back, not being able to get through to the right services and obviously still keep trying for the patients. So thank you very much, Marcella. You're welcome. Yeah. Yeah, I when I was um, working on the presentation, I realised that we really do a lot. Um, but you know, until you don't see it, it's like, yeah, feels automatic. Um, I feel we do like a really valuable um, role. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> but I think I think it's the same for obviously other other professions that are obviously that we this, um, that we work with as well. We, until we actually speak to them and ask them, you know, can you do this or is this something you can deal with? We don't actually know in detail what they can actually help and support with so i think the same is for other roles as well that until it's like you say you see it or you ask somebody for their support you don't actually know how much they actually can do in as well as their part of their job role as well so yeah and i think it, it's, a, it's a minefield out there trying to find the right service sometimes and sometimes you're looking for a service um and then uh, you'll have, we we have a chat where we'll ask you know the other social prescribers and all of a sudden there's a service there that you didn't even know about no matter how hard you search so that can be really hard to find the right service even if it exists it's not you can't always search, you can't always find it on a search mm -hmm. yeah Google can't replace social prescribers yet no no uh <laughs> <laughs> would be nice but no. <laughs> And any other questions out there? So I suppose one of the questions is how how do you tell people? How do you feed back to the bigger teams about the great work that you're doing? I suppose this is a question from Marcella for her area, but there might be other areas here mm. on this call today. So what we do now with PCN, uh, you know, we try to promote and share case studies. Um, so that's our way to, you know, uh, promote what we do. And also it makes it easier for the other professional to understand what we do with practical scenarios. Brilliant. Avril? Oh. Case studies the same and we also do, um, do a letter for the PCN, a newsletter that goes out every month, just gives them a... Uh, you know, sort of, we put three top points in uh, what we're doing or what services we've engaged with. And yeah, that's our sort of, in Ashfield North, that's what we do. Brilliant. Have you had any feedback about that? Is it appreciated by the wider team? Yeah, because we've had GPs that have like sort of emailed and said thanks for the information that we've put on it. Because we always put, if we've met somebody and there's a link, we always put that on as well. 
Nice. So and we share, we've got a community assets list that we've, we update and share across the PCN as well, where everybody's got to, is able to access it. Brilliant. That sounds really good. Great. Any final questions? Otherwise, hopefully I can let everyone go safely and with a bit of a, a bit of a time to catch up with a cup of tea or your lunch so you can get back into practice safely and in a good frame of mind. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much. And yeah, thanks thank again, you. Marcella, for all of thank that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all for thank joining you. us today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.